Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Fusion Friday. My name is Brian Mokoglinsu. My name is Alex Alvarez. And we're application engineers here at Katia Technologies. So today's Fusion Friday is actually going to be a recap of the Fusion 360 meetup that we had uh, here or the, at the Urban Workshop in Costa Mesa uh, in Southern California. So if you guys missed that, if you guys weren't able to attend it, uh, this will be the perfect webinar mm -hmm. for you. And at that, um, at that meetup, we were talking about, we talked about CAM, we talked about uh, 3D printing, and we talked about uh, mesh editing, and we did a little uh, tour around their shop as well. Uh, so hope you guys enjoy. Um, for those of you who are new to our Fusion Fridays, it's a series of webinars that we do every other Friday on Fusion 360 topics like CAM, drawing, modeling, uh, all, all the tools that Fusion 360 has to offer. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have any questions at all during the webinar, uh, feel free to leave it in the comments section and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. If you miss any of this webinar or if you want to see our past Fusion Friday, check us out on YouTube, uh, Kati Fusion Fridays. We have a playlist uh, up on there. Um, but without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Alex and we'll get started. Perfect. All right. So to start off, um, let's talk a little bit about Fusion 360, right? So if we take a look up here. We see that we have the three pillars that Fusion 360 was essentially built on. Uh, so again, Autodesk wanted a tool that took you from the design stage of your product all the way to manufacturing without necessarily having to leave that tool, right? So again, that can be uh, multiple different tools, right? You would need some sort of CAD tool to design your actual product, then do some simulation on it, so computer-aided engineering software. Um, after you do the testing, you make sure that it's not going to fail out in the market or when it's you know getting tossed around by kids or, or human beings. Um, you actually, actually manufacture that part. Um, so again, that comes with a CAM software, right? Uh, maybe you want to do some sort of marketing or, or sales strategies. Uh, you're going to need some sort of rendering tools as well. So again, Fusion 360 combines all of that into one single tool, giving your team a much more integrated experience. So we also have connected. So Fusion 360 is connected to the cloud. Um, again, what that means for you is that you can really leverage today's modern technology and take advantage of the computing power that comes by being connected to the cloud. Uh, so connecting, connected also means connecting people. Uh, again, being that you are connected to the cloud, you can always have your team access uh, all your team's data in one seamless, easy to access environment. And one thing I want to add to that actually is you never have to pack and go anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, once you save your data and the people on your project, you can immediately have access to that data without any lost files or anything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so then lastly, we have accessible, uh, again, most of you guys using engineering softwares or, or some sort of high-end um, computer-aided design software. Uh, if you guys are using a Mac, right, for the, the hipsters out there, the millennials, um, you don't have to boot camp your Mac anymore. Again, Fusion 360 is accessible both on Windows and Mac platforms. All right, so now let's talk about some of the benefits that a CAD CAM software like Fusion 360 brings to the table. All right, so first and foremost, uh, Fusion 360 does have AnyCAD capabilities. So some of you probably have heard of AnyCAD, some of you haven't. Um, essentially, AnyCAD is Fusion 360's capabilities or abilities to actually maintain associativity um, of the part with its original CAD software. Right, so take, for example, um, a SOLIDWORKS part. Right, So I do have a little snippet of my data panel here. Um, you'll notice that one of them has this little yellow icon, right? So what that's telling me then is that that part was dropped into essentially what we call a desktop connector. Um, so you essentially just save the part into that desktop connector. Let's say after you're done with it, modeling it inside of SolidWorks. Um, and then that part or that desktop connector is linked directly to my Fusion 360 data panel. All right, so again, any change that goes through SolidWorks is going to automatically go into Fusion 360 as well. Um, so I'm always going to have the latest revision, if you will, of that part. Now, we did have some pretty good questions around this, um, one of them being, well, do you have the previous revisions of the part? Um, I actually personally haven't tried it, so that's something that we are going to test out today to see if it does go through. Um, but again, the other model that we have there is your standard Fusion 360 part, right? So again, any change that, that you do inside of Fusion 360, let's say your other team member does have Fusion 360 and he makes a change to that one. Um, those versions or those previous uh, re revisions of the part are going to be um, automatically 
uh, updated. So one downside to this is that you do need a Fusion Team Hub in order to essentially have the, uh, the AnyCAD capability, right? So um, if that's something you're interested, feel free to reach out to either Brian or myself. And we can either talk a little bit more about um, how to set up your Fusion Team Hub, or we can even give you a, a quick trial, right, if you guys wanted to test it out at your, your facility. All right, so another benefit to a CAD CAM software, right? So you get tons of benefits prior to actually adding your tool pads. Um, I know oftentimes as a, you know, as a machinist or a designer, you sometimes want to make small tweaks to the model, not necessarily to change the model, but to change the way the tool pad is going to interact with that model. Um, again, so if we take a look at the picture, we see that we may want to either patch you know, that surface in order to get a clean transition on the surface, um, or you may just want to extend the surface so that the tool path actually goes a little bit past that surface and gives us a, a nice tool path at the edge, right? So, or a nice surface finish. Now, again, if we didn't have the CAD capabilities, uh, we would have to be jumping through hoops, either sending the part back to the customer to get that change done, or maybe even going, exporting the part into a different CAD software, right? So again, these are some huge benefits to actually having both the CAD and the CAD software um, integrated into, into one tool. Uh, we actually even have a few customers who use Fusion 360 specifically for the sole reason to, you know, to do data translation between their, you know, the, whatever the customer sends them and the feature camera or their power mode tools, right? So it's a pretty powerful tool. Um, again, you can definitely benefit from having the CAD side of the, uh, of the tool path or the tool in here. All right, so what we did for the for the uh, the meetup, we did a, a live demo, right? So this is the part that we actually did. It's a one-handed bottle opener. You might see some of these around. Um, and we added our own little twist to it, right, with the, the I guess, if you will, the, the pattern around the outside. Um, and we did it using the Chick One Lock vise, right? So we're a big fan here at Kativa of the Chick One Lock uh, for the main reason is how easy it is to actually swap the soft jaws in and out. So especially for some of you guys that are running multiple different parts throughout the day. Uh, you don't have to spend hours on end changing out the vise or maybe even changing out the jaws, you know, some complicated jaws. With this, we have Brian showing how easy it was to just loosen the bolt, swap the jaws out, and then go back to a different set of jaws, right? Yeah, those are my hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go to Fusion 360 um, and take a look at the software. All right, so this is going to be the actual um, end goal here, right? So we're going to have our, our one lock vise. Uh, we're going to have our part in there as well. Uh, and we're actually going to be modeling our stock into the, the part here, right? So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to say that we want to start off then with a brand new clean file here. Let me go ahead and show the data panel, right? So essentially, if you guys aren't familiar with Fusion 360, this is going to be what we call the data panel on the left, right? Essentially, that's where you're going to be storing all your projects. Um, the way I typically work inside the data panel is I, uh, I, whichever customer I'm working with, I like to create a specific project for them. Um, and then, based on the project, I like to store all their models, of course, inside that project. Right. So the neat thing about that is that you can always invite people. Let's say they're using uh, Fusion 360 as well. Just invite some of their people here. Um, again, they're going to have access to all this data. If they ever need to make a change to the model, you don't need to send anything out. Just go into the Baja Team Racing project and have access to all of their models. Right. So if we scroll down here, we see that we do have, again, the CAM samples project. right? So inside the CAM samples, you have a couple files that you can work with. If you're ever wondering how to do either you know, lathe tools or, or turning tool, uh, tool paths uh, with live uh, tooling, Go ahead and open this part and see exactly what the Autodesk employees are doing with the parts um, in order to get these working or functioning tool pads. Right? And then we also have this work holding folder. Um, the chick work holding on my, on my behalf is really a, a huge um, plus for Fusion 360. Um, again, all these models or all these, these uh, devices were imported directly from the chick work holding um, website. Right? So again, you can open up the part, save it into your project, and then start creating templates based off of that specific device, right? So we also have Mighty Bytes in there. We have a few more of the, the common 
uh, vices that you would see at the, uh, the shop floor. All right, so you know, four, you guys will see that I already have that specific vice created or, or saved inside my project, right? So now it's as easy as just inserting it into current design. But if I try to insert it into the current design, right, I'm, I don't necessarily get a error message, but if I look down here, right, it gives me a little, a little warning, right? So please save this design before inserting components. So let's go ahead and save it. Let's give it a name. Right, so we essentially created or saved the parent file of this, uh, of this assembly, right? So now what I can do is just start dropping in some of these parts. Right, so let's bring the chick one lock into position here. Um, so if we take a look at our view queue, we see that the z-axis is pointing up, but our vice is uh, essentially not in the correct orientation, right? So before actually clicking anything else, let's go ahead and rotate it, make sure that we rotate it into exactly how we're gonna see it inside our machine. Right, so the z-axis is gonna be straight up and down. So when we look down, this is what we're gonna be looking at, right? So I'm happy with that orientation. Um, now again, this is gonna be a, a, a template, right? So I don't necessarily need to have a reference link to the part that I have in uh, my project. So I can always just break the link here. And before actually moving ahead to the next step, if I click and drag, right, so it's not grounded. So let's go ahead and make sure that we either ground or, or fix this to, um, to position, right? So again, it's as easy as just right clicking ground that. Uh, now if I try to move it, it's not gonna go anywhere. But the joints are still going to be, um, I guess, working as they should, right? So Jaws is, is fully moving. Um, next, what I wanna do then is make sure that I have some sort of fixed position, right? Because when I go to actually create the soft draw, I wanna make sure that when I go to the machine or the actual draw or the uh, device inside the machine, I know exactly what spacing I have between these two jaws, right? So I have a half inch style pin um, at my disposal, so I can just go ahead into the joints, edit the drive joint here, and change that to be half an inch, right? So again, I wanna make sure that that doesn't move um, when I'm sketching or, or doing some sort of extrude cut on the draw. So let's go ahead and make sure that we lock that as well, right? So now everything is locked into place. So now we can start beginning um, creating some of these, these uh, profiles for the soft jaws, right? Now again, if I were to start, right, so that goes back to our previous um, webinars. If I decided to start a, a brand new sketch, right, notice where that sketch gets created, right? It's under the parent file. Um, again, we want that sketch to be under the chick one lock component. Um, and that's just to keep everything organized, right? We want to make sure that we, we know where everything's at and we keep track of, of where all our sketches and all our, um, our extrusions are going to be at. So let's go ahead and back that up one step and activate this component, right? So now we're specifically working with this chick one lock component. So now let me go ahead and project a few points here. project those two points, and now I want to do a reference line between that in order to give me a center point for my center rectangle, right? So right now I can just do an, an arbitrary um, rectangle, right? So I can do, I don't know, one a quarter. And the only dimension that matters here to me is how deep I'm going to make that cut, right? Um, to me, 100 thousandths is, is enough for the part that we're working with. Um, again, depends on how aggressive cuts you're gonna be taking or, or how you know, much material you're gonna be working with. Uh, so make sure that you make those cuts accordingly, right, or that depth. From here then I can extrude, let's say minus two and a quarter, right? So notice that it's creating a separate body at this point. Um, so we take a look at the operation, we see why. Go ahead and change that to cut, and then click OK, right? So again, we don't see any of those features that we just created under the parent file as a different uh, option here, right? So we expand the chip one lock, we see that the sketch was created there, right? And we see that the feature is also under, under that one as well. 
All right, so now before we actually move on, let's go ahead and create um, a couple holes here, right, or wishbones as we call it. Um, and again, you want to do that so that the corners don't pinch up on uh, these sharp corners, the corners on your stock. Uh, and it brings up your, your stock, right, when you're machining. So one of the little things that you guys want to look out for prior to actually machining your your soft jobs here, right? So, uh, two hundred two ninety-five drill, and then just cut down to that face there, right? So we get that little warning. Um, it's saying that it's a new body. We can change that to cut and hit OK. Okay, so at this point, we're ready to create our stock. Uh, once again, best practices, right? We want to make sure that we right-click on this new component. We can rename this if we wish, name it stock. And again, if I'm a big uh, feature on using the S key, right? So that brings up the toolbox, as we like to call it. Um, from there, if you guys aren't familiar with, with Fusion 360 or maybe some of the um, uh, the features or some of the commands, right? Uh, just go ahead and use the S key and type that that command inside the, the dialog box, right? So in this case, I want a two-point rectangle. Let's go ahead and just do an arbitrary rectangle here. Um, so from here, I know that my stock then is three and a quarter by one and three quarters. So we can stop the sketch there and extrude that up five eighths. Right, so this is what we have so far. Um, again, it's not showing me the exact the um, the exact uh, I guess visualization of what I would have on the machine. But this jaw can always move back and forth, right? I don't want to move it now at, or or at this point because we still have to create the profile for this other side. Right, so all we really care about is this soft draw and the that the stock is flush with the the fixed the fixed soft draw in the back. Right, so at this point, then I can just go ahead and bring down the opacity a little bit, and I can start bringing in some of these other parts. Right. All right, so we brought in the bottle opener there. Uh, again, you don't have to necessarily place it exactly in position, but just get it somewhere close. So I like to typically like to put it somewhere above the uh, the stock there. Um, and let's begin aligning some of these faces, right? So again, I like to use a line. Um, it doesn't necessarily fix or constrain these faces, but it's just aligning the components, right? So we just align those two faces. Um, reason why I did that is because I want to make sure that I'm flush with this face, right? So when I move that specific model, right, now I know that I'm directly flush with that face, and I'm just going to move it, let's say, 30 thousandths, right? That's just going to be to do a facing operation. Um, and now I can just go ahead, top view, and start placing it into position, right? So again, this isn't critical for me. Um, if you did, you can just create a couple points inside your stock um, and inside your your main model, uh, and then you can fix them into position, right? But again, being that we are going to be working off of the G54 from our fixed draw, um, whatever profile we have inside the stock is the profile that the, the machine is going to be cutting. Right? So I'm happy with that one there, with that position. Uh, so again, you want to make sure that you do an as-built joint in this case, right? You can either ground the, the bottle opener or you can just do an as-built joint as, as I'm doing. All right, so what do we want to join? We want to join this with the stock. And let's say we wanted to ground the stock as well, right? So now nothing should move here out of place. Okay, so at this point, looks like we're ready to begin adding a few toolpaths to the part, right? So I want to hold off on the other profile and you guys will see why in a second here. All right, so if you guys weren't familiar with the CAM environment inside of Fusion, uh, fairly straightforward, right? Working from left to right, starting with our setup, adding a few toolpaths, 
Um, if you guys do need fourth and fifth axis capabilities, you are going to have to get Fusion 360 Ultimate. Um, other than that, there really aren't many differences, right, besides the, the simulation, the extra simulation um, or advanced simulation that Fusion 360 Ultimate gets. So after you added some tool paths, you want to make sure that you simulate those tool paths, make sure you don't have any collisions or, or any unexpected tool path motion. Um, and then finally, post out to your machine. Right? So let's go ahead and start off with our setup. Uh, again, by default, being that we have an entire assembly, it's going to try to pick this entire assembly as the model that we want to machine. Right? That's not the case for us. This is the model that we want to start off with. What stock do we want to use? Again, we can do fixed size blocks, relative size box, or a from solid stock. Right? We already modeled the stock, so let's go ahead and pick that. Um, and then the work coordinate orientation, right? So luckily, I modeled it to how it was supposed to be, um, so I don't need to change anything there. The only thing I do need to focus on, though, is where do I want the um, the G54, in my case, to be? Um, and I'm going to use the corner of this soft chart, right? So we want to make sure that you have selected point. And we're going to be using that point that I projected earlier, right? Click OK. And there we get a preview of how that's going to look like. All right, so now what I can do then is, again, start off with a facing operation, right? So 2D face. Which tool do I want to use? It's two and a half inch face mill. Um, I can always change some of these parameters if I wish, right? But again, these get auto populated um, from whatever uh, parameters we set inside of our tool library. Now, with the facing operation, we just have to select the tool and click OK, right? So it automatically knows where the top of the model is at and the top of the stock is at, and it creates that tool path accordingly. Right, so now I can do a, a drilling operation. Right, Let's go ahead and drill out this hole so that we can have an end mill come in there and uh, machine some of that, that material out. Right? So in this case, let's use this end drill bit. Um, now that I see this, we can go ahead and hide the sock. We don't really need it anymore. Right? Let's go ahead and select that face. I get a quick preview of how that looks like when it's going to be inside the part. Uh, and I can see that it's not going to go all the way through the hole. Right? So let's go ahead and check. The drill tip at the bottom, again, that's found under the Heights tab. There's tab over in the drilling cycle. And let's do a breakthrough depth of well, 50 thousandths. Right? This is going to be out of aluminum, so I don't necessarily need a peg drilling operation, but we can always do a peg drilling if we wanted to. And then just click OK. All right, so at this point, then, I can do a 2D pocket operation. Right, again, using a quarter inch flat end mill. Right now, which pocket do I want to machine? I want to go ahead and machine, not that one. This one right here. All right, uh, the heights. We can go ahead and machine a little bit lower than that. So let's say fifty thousand slower. Um, passes. Make sure that we have socks leave unchecked. Um, we can bring the maximum step over down, right? So again, we're using a quarter inch flat. Um, let's say you didn't know exactly, you know, which step over to do. Uh, you can always just right click on this edit expression, and there's an expression already built in to the pocket operation, right? I can clear that out. Let's say I want the tool diameter. I can spell, and this is going to be. Underscore tool diameter. Uh, let's say I just want 20% of the tool diameter there. Click OK, and it changes that value to a 50 thou step over. Right. Let's say that recipe works for you. You can always right click, make that your default. So now every time that you create a 2D pocket operation, it's going to default to 20% of whatever that tool diameter is. Um, I can also do multiple depths. Right. So same thing with this. I can edit expression. Change that out. Change that to be tool flute length divided by three. Right? So it should give me essentially three step downs or roughly three step downs. Um, and you want to make sure that it, when you use some of these expressions, right, these parameters have to be exactly uh, as you see them here. Otherwise, it's not going to go through for you. 
Um, so if you ever want to see exactly which expression or how these expressions are written out, just hold Alt on your keyboard, right? So parameter name, you can see at the very bottom there it says smoothing deviation. Right? So for this one, hold Alt. Maybe not this one, but there it is. And it says tool flute length divided by three, maximum step down, right? So that's one way to actually check your your tool paths there. All right, so let's go ahead and click OK on that. You'll notice that it's going to ramp down as a helix, so let's go ahead and change that under the linking tab. Right. So instead of a helix, we want a pre-drill. What's the pre-drill position? It's going to be this hole there. And we now have a plunge going down. All right, so now let's go ahead and rough out some of this material on the outside. Again, that same tool that I use is a tool that it's going to automatically pick up. Um, for the heights, let's go a little bit below that by 50 thousandths also. Passes, stocks to leave, I just want 20 thousandths on the wall there. Um, and really, that's all I'm going to change here. Right? So the no engagement feed rate is telling me that it's a little bit slower um, or faster, actually, than what my original cutting feed rate is, right? So I can change this cutting feed rate to 75 um, and go from there. All right, so again, this is a roughing operation. I can go back to the very top, do a 2D contour to just finish the wall, or I can do a derived operation, right? So we're, in, again, in the business of, of programming pretty efficiently and, and pretty quickly. Um, so try to get familiar with these derived operations, right? So it's going to take the same tool, um, the same parameters that I really use for the 2D adaptive, and it's going to take them and apply them to this 2D contour toolpath. Right, so that's essentially what I wanted. Now what I can do then is start using my favorite toolpath, right, in my, in my opinion. Um, so we want to create that little honeycomb pattern that we saw on the top of the part. Uh, let me go ahead and expand this a little bit. So that's going to be found under 3D toolpaths, and it's going to be the project toolpath. Now, for this toolpath, unfortunately, you kind of have to do a workaround for it. Um, so you can't use a, let's say, a chamfer mill, right? So it doesn't take any pointy drills or any pointy uh, tools in order to create that toolpath. If you uh, if you try to use that one, uh, it's essentially just going to give you an error, and it's going to say you can't use this tool, right? So what I did then is I just use a 3 uh, inch ball. Uh, end mill. Um, and the reason for that is because the uh, the contact point or the the the, the point for the where it creates that toolpath is the center of that ball end mill, right? So we can just click that. I created a little note for myself saying, hey, that's going to be an actual chamfer mill. Um, so now for geometry, it's asking which curve selections do you want? Well, I want the one that I use to project that honeycomb over, right? Uh, we had a couple questions on how I actually created that. So I found the pattern, um, you know, Google, and I uh, essentially converted that to an SVG, right? So if you guys have any questions on that, I believe we have a previous uh, webinar explaining how to do that. But if not, just reach out to us and we'll walk you through that. Um, and we also want an axial offset of 3,000. Right? From here, go ahead and click OK. And it gives us that tool path, right? We zoom in and we see that this, the tool path is actually three thousandths below the actual model there. Right? So then now to finish off, let's go ahead and do a 2D contour using a chamfer mill, right? And for this, it's as easy as just selecting the, the contours there and then giving it some sort of a width and a tip offset, right? So I'm kind of speeding through these last parts. Uh, again, that's because Brian still has to do his part on 3D, uh, 3D printing, right? So um, we're running really close on time. So let me just go ahead and simulate this and then jump over to Brian's part. So there's a contour operation, right? There's a project tool path, and then there's a champ, right? So. One thing I like to do actually is um, turn off the body, right? So we'll, that gives us a pretty good preview of how the part's going to look like. Um, sometimes by having that body turned on or that component turned on, um, we get
get like a false sense of, of what we're looking at. Right? So um, really from here, all I really wanted to do was show you guys how to save the stock Right, bring it into your your actual assembly, and then use the remaining stock to create that last toolpath to to machine the the top hat right that we have left over here. Um, but again, we're running somewhat short on time, so let me go ahead and jump over to a little situ with Brian and get his part going. All right, thanks, Alex. So yeah, uh, Alex did half of the uh, what he showed here at the the meetup. Uh, he did the uh, the bottom half as well, where you flip it over to the other side. So. You guys were there. Um, you, guys, you guys got to see that part as well. So first, I'm going to start here with the. Actually, I'm going to go back to the presentation and give you guys a a good uh, introduction into uh, leading into the um, the mesh environment here. So, what what I talked about at the meetup uh, was how the four different ways into editing a mesh file in Fusion 360 and how we can manage that in Fusion. And I first start off with what is an STL file, and those are uh, it's a mesh body that consists of thousands of triangles, uh, which we like to call facets, and we like to call these dumb bodies because you can't really do anything but view them in the software. Um, STL files are important because of four different reasons. One is 3D scanners. Uh, when you if you have a 3D scanner, you know that when you scan something, you get an STL file similar to this hand here that consists of uh, thousands of different triangles um, that you can uh, then use to edit uh, the, or that you can use to hopefully edit. And you can do that, you can edit that in here in Fusion. Uh, then we have simulation. Uh, if you ran static or thermal simulation before, you know that right before you're, you run the simulation, it's going to convert it into a mesh for you. And the more meshes, usually the more uh, accurate the simulation is. Uh, but the, that's where an STL file comes into play as well, or meshes. Um, the third is 3D printing. Uh, before you bring it into your 3D printer, it actually goes uh, as an STL file to your slicer or your preprocessor. And that cuts it up into 1,000 different layers and then turns into G-code. And then it gets sent to your 3D printer. And lastly, STL files are a common file type. Uh, most Traditional CAD software can bring it in. They can view it, like I said earlier, and they can export it. So the four goals of today is to show you guys uh, the four different ways in which you can manage meshes. These aren't the only ways in which you can manage meshes, meshes in Fusion, but I think these are some of the cool and, and really powerful ways. Again, guys, any questions you have either on the, the topic that I covered or the topic that Brian's about to cover, feel free to ask them in the, the chat box. Yeah, we'll do our best to answer those. Yeah, let's be as interactive as possible. So here in the Fusion workspace, we are in the, the model environment, and we have an STL file here. This one has about 8,000 meshes, uh, if you check here uh, under the properties. And usually uh, files can have tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of uh, different tra uh, facets. So as I hover over this and I want to edit it, notice how it highlights the entirety of it. Um, that doesn't allow me to maybe edit just one little feature of it. So what we can do is the mesh to B-Rep feature. So I'm going to right click on this and hit mesh to B-Rep. And that's the first way we can manage uh, these files in Fusion. Just convert it straight to a B-Rep or a boundary representation or a body representation, whichever you'd like to call it. And now when I go in here, we can actually pull these particular faces uh, out with uh, parametric mo uh, modeling tools. However, notice how I pull out a random uh, triangular face, and maybe that's not really what I want to do. Maybe I want to pull out the entire uh, face of this model. So what I can do is use Fusion's direct edit modeling features, select the face, and then hit delete, and it actually removed all those other faces for me because Fusion uh, deletes it in respect to these the uh, presiding surface that already existed. Uh, so now I have one face to work with rather than those uh, dozens of other faces. So now when I go to use a parametric uh, tool onto this, it allows me to pull the entire face forward. And I can also do it to other parts of the of the model as well. And usually this works best when the model has a completely flat faces. Uh, I wouldn't re really recommend this uh, with scans, but more so 
just STL files or, st or files that were converted into STL files. Uh, I can do another feature right here where I can pull this to uh, the front face here. And you can just pretty much from, from what I started with, which was an STL file that I couldn't do anything to, uh, now I'm able to actually turn into a B rep or bo body representation and actually do uh, uh, create parametric features onto it. So I think that's real, uh, really useful. Uh, the uh, second example that I showed was how to actually apply T splines onto your STL bottle bodies, and that if you can imagine the the T splines uh, like a ceram wrap wrapping uh, this STL body here. So what I did was I I created a plane, and if you can think of this as my ceram wrap. And I'm going to saran wrap the top part of my uh, the roof here of my of my car. And we actually had a customer who had this very uh, same uh, need for uh, a body, uh, like a T-spline body, instead of an STL file. So then they could show their vendor that hey, we have an editable model uh, of our of our product because they scanned their product, but they they didn't have any way to. Uh, convert their STL files to to a, a body, an editable body. So what I'm doing now is I'm getting my uh, T-spline body really close to the, the car. And then I'm going to use the pull command, which, is, which essentially pulls the T-splines as close as it can uh, to the nearest uh, STL body. And it's going to be the top of the car there. If I hide my mesh body there, we have this complex surface. Um, and if I hide my T-spline edges as well, we have this complex surface. Looks like there's a little uh, uh, mess up there. But we have this surface here that, that really hug the, um, the roof of the car uh, that you can't really, that you would have to uh, do a lot of uh, uh, messing around. If you were to try to do it in other software, you'd have to maybe draw a sketch on the to get as close as you can to the STL file, maybe try some loss and some sweeps, uh, but that really hugged the uh, the profile there. We have a we have a question here from Steven, Brian. Uh, how did you know to start off with that many faces for your original? Oh yeah, so so usually um, it's up to the person who's modeling. It's like the number of faces. Uh, the more number of faces you have, the more rigid actually your model is going to look. Um, but the least number of faces uh, gives you more a more organic look, but you have a little bit less control, I would say. Uh, so it really depends on the the person modeling. Um, I decided to go with the four by four by four because it it gives me like the best looking um, uh, T spline in my opinion. So it's just a matter of preference, I, I would say. You can also add more edges, right? As you for the more, um, I guess the the more need or the, the finer details of the model, you can always add more edges and then create those finer details as you, you go along with it, right? Again, if you start off with 50 edges of 50 by 50, I mean, it's going to be hard to control each individual edge, whereas, you know, you can just control or add more edges as you're going, exactly. going through it. So what I'm going to do next is actually apply these faces uh, down below here on this hood. And the reason being is because there's a crease here at the top of the roof of the car, as you can see here uh, along with the mouse, uh, that wasn't actually um, accentuated uh, from the T-spline body that I created. And, and I want to show you a way to actually accentuate that, except instead of showing the roof of the car, I'm going to show the, the hood of the car. I'm going to accentuate this ventilation for the hood here instead. Uh, so I'm, I'm creating uh, individual faces of my plane rather than rather than creating just one entire plane and using the pull command. So I'm going here to the face command and just going one at a time um, throughout this. And the reason I'm doing this is so then I can go in here with this face command to give me that indent uh, that the plane the plane command with the pull uh, wouldn't uh, allow me to do. Or it wouldn't it wouldn't give me as an accurate result, and this is a little bit repetitive, but I think it's totally worth it. Uh, 
especially if you have other tools to compare with like sweeps and lofts, you can't really compare to trying to create this kind of surface. It, you wouldn't have to work with a different tool like we are here with the T-splines. Would you say, Brian, there's a reason as to why you're doing uh, essentially rectangles instead of a different shape, like let's say a, a triangle? Yeah, so these T-splines work with these uh, four edged uh, polygons or, or rectangles. And it's it's just the easiest way that it's managed, and that's that's just how it is uh, in the T-spline mm -hmm. environment. Yeah, that's a good point too, right? Because I I'm definitely not a surface modeling expert by any means, but uh, when I first started off, I was trying to use triangles to get some of those shapes, right? And then once you actually you try to convert back from box mode to smooth mode, um, you can definitely see where triangles are are lacking, I guess, right? And, in terms of giving you that nice transition between different surfaces. Right, and yeah, if you try to create triangles in uh, in the this environment, uh, ev eventually you might run into something that uh, won't allow you to exit the, the environment because it, it, it works best with the uh, quads or four edges instead. All right, so finished creating my T-spline with those faces. It took about a few minutes here. And I have this complex surface that if I had the edges, you can see that it gives me that kind of uh, ergonomic flow uh, from the ventilation there. That if I just try to project the, the, the plane onto it, I wouldn't probably get the same result. Um, you can't really accomplish something like this with just sweeps and lofts, uh, unless you really like, you had a, you're a genius, I, I would say. Or you're an expert expert. Yeah, modeler. yeah, that would definitely take some some years of surface modeling experience, and and yeah, that's something that you could probably take a couple hours doing on days, maybe. And next, just to clean up the faces that I hand created, I can use tools like the flatten command to flatten it about this plane. I'll do the same with the uh, the hood of the car here. And then we have, like the mirror tool in the sketch environment, we have a mirror tool in the um, in the T-spline environment as well, so we don't have to kind of repeat what you already did, and it's just for uh, efficiency's sake, as well as um, just looks, just having a mirrored uh, object looks a lot better. And now whatever I, whatever I do to one side of this model, since I have the symmetry on, uh, will affect the other side as well. So that's the second uh, way to manage your to manage your T-spline bodies, uh, or sorry, your mesh uh, your meshes in Fusion 360 is to apply T-splines to it. And the third way, which I'm not going to go uh, all the way to the to the end of it, but I want to show you um, how to get started with it, is to actually create a mesh uh, section. And what this essentially does is, if you were if you could imagine tying uh, wrapping three ropes around this uh, forearm here. So you'll, here, this will be my for, uh, first rope. Um, this will be my second rope. And make, I'll make one more rope or mesh section. Um, and then once you use this tool in conjunction with the uh, fit curves and mesh section, you can essentially loft these three uh, mesh sections together and then you'll get something like that will hug really hug the uh, the texture or the the curvature of this mesh body and that's essentially what I showed as well as the, uh, at the meetup and this is the third way to approach uh, that I wanted to show in uh, how to approach how to edit the SDL file and lastly uh, there is this uh, carabiner here uh, with this uh, name energy inner design and this was a file I got from Thingiverse um, the other three I got from <laughs> grabcad.com um, so this file essentially uh, what I want to do is this is an SDL file that I want to get rid of the name and maybe put my own name if I want this carabiner to be uh, custom to me uh, so what I can do is hop it to the mesh environment and notice how if I open down this work space, the mesh environment isn't there. Uh, to make it appear, what I need to do is actually hide the design history 
or do not capture JSON history. Now I have a mesh environment to work in. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my brush size uh, just a little bit bigger so now I can uh, brush over this name. Maybe shrink the brush size to deselect some of the features here. And then if I don't want this name there anymore, I can just hit delete. And unfortunately, it created a hole in my model. So I want to repair that. Uh, so I'm going to double click on the edge of this hole. And it selected the entirety of the hole for me. And then I can use this erase and fill command, which gives me a flat surface and repairs my STL file. Then what I can do next is go into the model workspace. And then I can go to the text tool and type in my name. Maybe shrink the, the font a little bit. Give it some, uh, some volume. And then let's go ahead and locate that uh, where, the, where I want to place it, where I deleted those uh, letters. Still floating in space. I'll bring that down a little bit. And notice how these are actually 3D bodies, uh, and this is a mesh body. So I can't combine those yet. What I'm going to need to do is convert these into a mesh body. So all I need to do is highlight that, right click, and there is that B rep to mesh conversion. Now it uh, has those uh, triangles or those facets that we see, uh, that we saw throughout the, all these STL files. And now it's also uh, considered a mesh body here on the left-hand side. So now what's neat is in the mesh environment, uh, we can select all these mesh bodies. And there is, like a combine, there is a merge bodies command that allows you to merge all these together into one. So now I have one mesh body that I can export out to a slicer or a preprocessor to be 3D printed. And we're not going to go into the preprocessor or the slicer tonight, uh, today because we're running a little short on time. But uh, you can send this out as an STL file to that, to that uh, slicer. Uh, sometimes people wonder, hey, when I try to export, I don't see an STL. Uh, so for example, if I turn this body back on, and I right click on this, you can actually save your body as an STL and that's located here uh, by right clicking on your body. So that's another way to do it. Or you can use the uh, 3D print tool, which is located uh, up here at the top. I believe uh, Alex might have hit the, uh, the, the, the toolbar or the make here. So I, what I did was I right clicked and I uh, reset it all back to the default. So here's the 3D printing uh, tool, which also exports it out uh, straight to your uh, 3D printing utility or as an STL file. All right, so that's all the content we have for you guys today as, as a recap for the Fusion 360 meetup. Uh, here's our information. Uh, Adam Hobbs is one of our Fusion 360 sales representatives. Um, but yeah, there's Alex and uh, my emails as well. So, uh, so yeah, so with that, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, coming in. Um, so thank you guys again for watching. Um, have a safe, safe weekend and a good Memorial Day weekend as well. Uh, so we'll see you on the next one. Yep. Thanks, guys.